Now, I want you to notice that there's a danger in taking ideas a little bit too seriously. There's a grave danger in sort of being the armchair thinker. There's a grave danger to be the smartest guy in the room, yet the person doesn't exactly know how to affect real changes in the world. So I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the most intelligent people, sometimes, not all the time, but they are some of the least effective people when it comes down to real problems that they need to solve in their lives. Uh, it's sort of like that stereotype of the nut and you, the, the nutty professor, you know, he's or he's so good at what he does academically, yet he's unable to function in anything else in his life. So what's going on there? How do we readdress this balance between life and ideas? How can we treat ideas in a way that's healthier? Uh, that's going to, in a sense, restore a healthier balance between us and life, between our heads and our hearts, between reality and the intellect. So that's going to be today's um, topic of discussion. But before we dive into that entire uh, entire train of thoughts, entire train of discussion, uh, let me tell you a little bit about today's video sponsor, italki. So in a sense, today we're going to be tackling a very interesting French writer named Voltaire. And I think this novel in my opinion, is such a better novel when I read it in French. Such a more engaging, the prose is so much more engaging. It has a certain musicality to it that is, in a sense, lost when I read it in English again recently. So if you want to read another novel, if you want to read something that you like in the original language, Italki uh, is going to present you with a system which allows you to uh, match yourself up with your ideal tutor. Match yourself up with a tutor that who you, who you like to work with uh, from one of 150 languages that's offered on this platform. So in a sense, you can select a tutor and the system of payment is you can pay from lesson to lesson. So there's no locking contract. There's not a thing that forces you to sign up for three months. There's not like a thing that forces you to study with a bunch of other people, but simply it is a one-on-one -on -one lesson where it allows you the freedom to choose between different languages and between different tutors anytime, anywhere. So you can allow yourself the flexibility of scheduling these lessons into your calendar and you can allow yourself that entire, you know, freedom to practice this language uh, on a native level. And of course, if you want to practice this language with other students, there's a community of enthusiastic language learners on this platform, italki who you can engage with when you're a part of the platform. So if that's what you're interested in, be sure to click the link in the description down below. And of course, if you are very enthusiastic about learning French, also there is also a link that you can follow on the screen here to find your perfect tutor for French. And for the younger audience or for the younger viewers of this channel, italki right now is teaming up with a lot of amazing teachers to offer lessons in Spanish, Chinese, and English uh, which is going to be a part of this campaign where you can potentially get 30 USD credit points for your language lessons and free language lessons if you follow the link in the des description down below to their social media pages. So check it out. It is a fantastic opportunity to acquire a new language right here, right now, um, because simply in the sphere of academic work, learning a new language could uh, could mean the difference between reading the subtleties of a text that's not available in translation. So if you are ready to take the leap, check out italki. It's going to be in the description down below. And right here, right now, let's get back to the topic of today's video, which is going to be how do we address this balance between a land of ideas and a land of sort of um sort of uh sort of reality because in reality there are a lot of problems that we need to attend to you know very practically there are a lot of housework around the house nowadays that i need to get done there's a lot of um grocery shopping that i need to do you know outside of the intellect there's also health there's relationships there's taking care of um people around you there's calling your sister who probably um had a really bad time after a bad exam uh, and there is just so many things that sort of like at times, this is the main point that's driving a lot of people away from directly facing the problems of reality, which is that when you've read enough, when you've got a certain idea about how reality works, once you've subscribed to a certain notion of like, okay, this is how reality works, you tend to disregard a big portion of what's actually in front of you. So ideas are so insidious and they're so tricky because they sort of like, they set up the perception 
filter from which you look at reality from. So in a sense, when you have the wrong idea in your head, it is going to filter reality in a certain way that's going to make you rather blind. Um, that's going to blindside you from many of the problems that you're not really seeing. So prime example from the novel that we're going to be talking about in this video, in this video Voltaire's novel, Condide. The entire novel is based upon this idea of optimism. So the main character of Voltaire went through every forms of human suffering possible, losing loved ones, you know, uh, getting stabbed, and then, you know, uh, losing a lot of fortune, and then um, losing a lover, and then seeing, seeing loved one uh, dis literally dismembered by robbers and by burglars. So he, the main character basically went through a whole stream of unfortunate events. If you think, you know, a series of unfortunate events was bad, you know, recondite, it's, um, it's a lot worse than that. So in a sense, Condit, when he was going through all of these misfortunes, he always held onto, the, uh, on, onto this idea of optimism. And then this is something that he almost never doubted throughout the novel, only towards the end of the novel that he really started to call this idea into question. So people uh, like this um, scholar named Magda, like Martin in the novel, he said to Condit that like you maybe you should abandon this idea. Maybe reality is not just um, optimistic all the time. Maybe you should abandon this idea to look at what's actually happening in reality. But Condit simply refused to do it because he was tutored by this great, um, great scholar when he was younger that he simply refuses to let this idea of optimism go. So he went through all of these very, very, very much um, disheartening events only to realize that at the very end of the novel that he must abandon the idea of optimism, that he that he must abandon that sort of uh, attachment to how he thinks reality should work uh, in favor of how reality actually works. And the novel concluded on a very beautiful note in which Voltaire's um, character, Condide, basically said, Il faut cultiver notre jardin, which means we must cultivate our gardens. We must cultivate what is directly in front of us. We, m we must act without letting ideas um, block us from making any practical moves in our lives. So I want you to realize that you also probably have a lot of ideas about how reality should work. It probably isn't optimism. It's probably something else. Do you believe people are certain ways because blah, blah, blah. Do you believe that there's an explanation for certain actions of yours? Do you believe that there's an idea that you simply cannot let go? If you let it go, your reality is going to go to shit. Do you have one of those ideas in your head? Now, that idea right there is, in a sense, taking over your reality. If you can't let this idea, uh, if you can't let reality to infiltrate this idea. So you, you're, in a sense, committing the same mistake as Voltaire's contemporaries. Or you're committing the same mistake as, um, as Condite throughout the novel of being so dedicated to an idea that you simply refuse to let reality adjust this idea once in a while. And one evening, I was on an evening train, and this is the perfect analogy for this kind of thing, where I realized that the announcement system was wrong. And I had an inkling that it was wrong, but I didn't really, didn't really think much about it. And I only listened to the, to, to the announcement system because I was, I was reading a book without paying any attention to what's going on outside of the carriage. That to a, to a certain point, I got off at a wrong stop simply because the, the announcement system was wrong. In a sense, I was so attached to what the announcement system says that I actually forgot to look outside of the carriage to see where I actually was. And, you know, conveniently, I got off at a wrong stop. But after that entire experience, it just goes to show how important it is to check your ideas against reality once in a while, to check your sacred beliefs about reality against reality to sort of adjust your worldview because your worldview is going to over, uh, is basically going to go over so many different iterations. It's going to go over so many different alterations that if you have certain very fixed Concepts, concepts about how reality works, it's going to make it very difficult for you to grow intellectually. So in a sense, I also want to call your attention to this why. Why is it the case that certain people are so attached to certain ideas? And I want to draw this lesson from French history. And because I'm certainly very into French literature, I'm currently doing a French major, finishing up a French major in literature, uh, in French literature. 
in which I started to realize that the reason why, you know, the French has this particular cynicism and this ability to reflect, a part of that was actually I was reading this book called um, The French Mind. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, very long history book about French culture and the birth of the French culture, where、uh, the author basically made an argument that a large part of that reflexivity, that contemplative. Sort of、um, attitude towards reality. It came from the series of defeats that the French had to endure. So, in a sense, it's based on defeats, and based upon these sour retreats, or based on these very sort of like a cynical, cynical regard to life. That you know, from that place, they've developed. They sort of like developed these very delicate thinking systems. They gave. They gave rise to so many of the finest philosophies、um, in the Western philosophical tradition. They、uh, they wrote so many great novels in the French literary canon that, in a sense, we have to also take that idea into account. That sometimes this retreating back into a land of ideas, there's sometimes this tendency for us to really use ideas to justify our shortcomings. It's in a sense an act of admitting defeat. It's an act of Being ineffective in the world, and now you must need a system of ideas to justify it. You need a system of、um, things to make you feel better. Hence, you retreat back to a more contemplative lifestyle or a, a more reflective lifestyle. And、uh, in moderation, that is fine. In moderation, contemplation serves to, you know, adjust your strategy to engage with life. But in excess, if all you do is to read books. Is all you if all you do is to sort of、um, justify your model of reality through ideas,、uh, you simply risk this component of not looking at reality directly, of not being a citizen of the world, of not exactly concerning yourself with what is exactly right in front of you, of ignoring the problems that are sort of like festering under the surface, that are sort of like、um, really、um, the shit that you sweep under the rug. It's going to come out in a in a in a, in a worse form. And no ideas can save you from that place when the shit really hits the fan. So that's what I want you to call your attention to: Are you ignoring certain parts of reality simply because you're using ideas as a form of escape? Are you using the humanities to make yourself better, or are you using the humanities as a form of convenient escapism? And what is that garden that you've refused to cultivate for the longest time? What is that garden that you've sort of neglected for the longest time? What is that one thing that you know that you should do, but you've never gotten around to it in reality? And are you running in circles with yourself in your head, trying to use ideas to justify this entire thing, without actually acting on it? That's what I want you to think about. And I want you to, and I want to end this, today's video essay with a very funny anecdote. Because this entire problem boils down to one thing: it boils down to intellectual snobbery, and it boils down to this idea of like intelligence reigns supreme. It's kind of like this enlightenment idea of scientific thinking, rationality, which is still playing out nowadays. Which is still the remnants of this rationalistic pride is still here somehow. And little pieces of it, it's still in our Western society, still in this Western society somehow. But to take that into an excess is to look down upon many of the very important components of reality that are not intellectual, that are not intellectually stimulating, that are not ideas or concepts, but that are simply honest and concrete actions. So I became a bookseller straight out of high school, just because I needed a job. And before I dedicated my life to doing this, doing basically teaching, dedicated my life to teaching,、um, I was a bookseller for for. Little, little less than two years,、uh, and the first day on my shift, my manager asked me to use a broom to basically sweep the entire store. And I, I, at the time, I was already very much into literature and history and philosophy. But then, when I held onto that broom, I kind of realized, for the first time in my life, I kind of realized, oh my god, I actually have no idea how to use a broom well. I actually have no idea how to clean the store properly. All these things they deserve so much learning. You know, even the most simple thing, like for example, trimming a trimming a bush, or should I say, going back to your back garden and then sort of like watering the plants. Even that takes a certain amount of practice and diligence to get right. So, 
one thing is not really above the other. You can be the most well learned person ever, yet you can be the you can be a learned fool. You can then still fall into this trap of unable to deal with the reality, unable to sort of um look at reality and to see what problems need to be solved, to see which direction you should steer your life towards. So I in a sense want to leave you with this. One pursuit is never above any other pursuits. And you need to figure out a way to sort of reconcile that conflict within you of using ideas to justify reality. Or when reality clashes with the ideas, resist the urge to escape back into ideas, back into novels, back into this portal of escapism, into your land of fantasies, and to actually face reality and to see what's going on and to use ideas to inform reality instead of using it as a device for escaping from reality. That's all I have for today. Thank you for watching this longer form or this longer video essay. Then again, the video script is going to be available on Medium. Hope you guys will check it out. Further readings on Kundi the novel, uh, a deeper dive into the subject. And thank you for watching. And I will see you in the next one.